All right, we are joined again by Dr. Andre Pop, Structural Heart Director at Ascension in Illinois, um, the most efficient TAVR operator out there. And he's gonna be talking about his valve clinic throughput. So Andre, take it away, bud. Thank you for uh, having me, guys. Uh, this is a subject that's uh, near and dear to, uh, to me. Uh, we're blessed to have an amazing valve clinic coordinator uh, who keeps us on our toes. And uh, I think that's uh, critical. Um, anyway, um, I think it's important, first of all, to see, to think about why it's important to have good throughput for the valve clinic. Uh, we have uh, good data uh, from a few, a few years ago from Malaysia, from Northwestern, showing that uh, patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis waiting for TAVR have a mortality about 3.7% a month. So if your backlog is three months, uh, you may be uh, allowing quite a number of patients to uh, have bad outcomes. So uh, throughput is very important. Um, also, uh, perhaps even more patients with uh, bioprosthetic uh, valves, especially porcine uh, bioprosthetic valves, when they fail, they fail via aortic insufficiency and they go into shock, uh, they go into florid uh, pulmonary edema very quickly. So uh, it's very important to get those patients in. And I think the important point about that is that those patients tend to go from mild to severe AI a lot faster than the, your average uh, AS patient goes from mild to severe AS. Uh, I think it's critical that uh, you only do tests that are uh, important and tests that are going to change your management. And you do as few tests as uh, possible. And we try very hard to maintain availability. Uh, yesterday, a uh, cardiologist called me and said, hey, I have this patient. She's not doing good. She's getting admitted for AFib. I'm going to turn her up. I want her seen. She's going to be seen next Wednesday. And if she needs a tower, she's going to get it probably in the next 10 days. Um, so uh, everybody who refers to us has both my cell phone number and that of our valve clinic coordinator. We get these patients in uh, no matter what happens. Um, the uh, valve clinic staff is very good at getting all the information. There's no point in repeating testing that has already been done. Um, and we uh, try to anticipate everything that may cause delays. If we feel that the patient needs to see a dentist, they can do that before they come to the valve clinic. Uh, if they, we feel that they need a cath, uh, which may not be required in everybody, but in the people who do require a cath, let the primary cardiologist do that and send you the films. Um, we maintain availability uh, for CTAs the morning of valve clinic. So pretty much everybody who comes to our clinic has already had a CTA. It may not be interpreted, but it's there for me to review it. And um, we do uh, try to have some availability for ad hoc echoes. Let's say you have an echo done somewhere else and uh, it's from a few months ago and the gradient is kind of borderline, you're not convinced uh, and you want your own people to repeat it, having that availability greatly simplifies the management for the patients. Um, the way we do it, and I know there's a tremendous amount of variability in this, we don't think of this as a TAVR clinic. We think of this as a valve clinic. So our surgeon and our interventional cardiologist are generally there at the same time. They generally see the patients separately, but uh, in rare cases, they'll see the patients together. Uh, and in the vast majority of cases, we have a decision on how we're going to manage the patient made in the valve clinic. Uh, if the patient uh, has something unusual or we're really not sure about what the best approach is, then we will discuss the patient in the valve conference, which happens come hell or high water once a week. But 95% of the patients will make a decision in valve clinic and we give them an appointment for treatment in valve clinic. Um, the, um, we, we minimize uh, the tests. Uh, we don't do carotid duplexes, we don't do PFTs. Um, we do the, all the blood work that is needed for the procedure as outpatient. We also type and screen the patients as outpatient. Uh, our la our uh, blood bank allows us to do type and screen one week before the procedure. So the patients actually get their type and screen done as outpatient, get a blood, band, uh, blood bank band that they take home with them. 
and they come in bringing it the morning of the procedure so they don't have to be uh, type and screen the morning of the procedure. Uh, we set clear expectations, uh, which helps us on the back end um, in terms of discharging patients. And we always maintain the availability to have at least one add-on every week, just in case we get somebody extra sick. And um, we have this form that we use, which basically uh, incorporates all the minimum, meaningful data that uh, you need in a patient going for uh, TAVR. And it allows the cardiologist, it allows the surgeon, it allows the anesthesiologist eventually to have access to all the data without having to go for the medical record. Uh, this is updated uh, constantly as new tests get added on. And it's really the uh, backbone of our uh, valve clinic. So if you do all this, you should have a, a highly efficient valve clinic. You should be able to work up your patients and turn them around from the moment they that you see them to Taver in uh, one week uh, or less. Hey, I, That's all I, I had. Thank you. Quick question on this. One. Where does this, um, where do you keep this spreadsheet? Is it on like a share drive that everyone has access to? Yeah, it's on a shared drive, but actually when I walk in Valve Clinic, there's a packet of these sheets that the Valve Clinic coordinator has printed. Uh, there's mm -hmm. one for me and one for the surgeon. I pick up, pick mine up, I take notes on it, and then uh, I use this to enter the consult in the computer. And then uh, the morning of the Valve uh, uh, conference, this is again handed out to everybody. We take it with us to the procedure room, again, having notes on it. If the anesthesiologist needs to know something about the patient, they look at the same thing. Everybody has access to this, and it's both paper and uh, electronic. That's great. And then uh, there was a couple key things I think you brought up. Um, one of them is, you know, we've minimalized our approach to doing the procedure, minimalist TAVR, right, in the, in the lab. And I think um, minimizing the number of tests is really critical. This is something I'm going through with my, my whole program now. Like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? You know, and we've talked on other discussions about this, but I think minimizing the total number of tests is key. And then having as much information as you can get when you see the patient and making a decision as soon as possible. And if you can get a surgeon in a clinic, we can't really do that right now, but we're going to try to get that done. But I think having all the information ahead of time, I think, uh, you know, I agree. I think that's the key is to, to getting these patients screened quickly. Yeah, Joe, I, mean, I think we talked about this. I mean, Elon Musk is arguably like the most efficient production manager ever, and he lives life by these working algorithms. And the first step of his algorithm is question every requirement, right? And so I think if you're looking at your own program, question every requirement, question every test you're doing. Why are we ordering PFTs? Why are we wearing carotids? Why are we getting all this testing? Why yeah. is it necessary? And then the second thing is delete, 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 delete everything you can that's extraneous and limiting patient throughput in your clinic. Because at the end of the day, the easiest way to implement change is just to get rid of extraneous stuff that you're not doing, right? And I think Andre's talked a lot on that stuff and it's really, really helpful. So the first step in developing an efficient clinic throughput is to delete everything you can. And then the third step is simplify and optimize, right? Of the kind of working algorithm. And, and when you simplify and optimize, I do think adhering to some of those best practices that Andre talked about is, you know, getting the CT scan on the same day of your clinic. It's not that hard to get block time from your CT scanners and having that CT scan right when the patient comes into clinic that you can review and assess is, is I think, critical. Um, and then the other thing I think that, that Andre touched on is having, having an, a working agreement with your surgeon that, hey, this is the type of patient that we feel the data supports Tavron. This is the type of patient that we feel would benefit from SAVR and everybody in between will talk about it valve topics, right? I mean, I think those are really the most boiled down best practices for, for clinic. I mean, Andre, what do you think? Well, so I, I think, you know, again, looking at programs around the country, it, it kind of boggles my mind when we have people who say, well, we're going to see the patient in valve clinic and we're going to determine if they need a CAT scan and if they need a CAF and whatever. And I'm like, you know, the determination of whether the patient needs a valve or not should already have been done, right? The referring cardiologist should know if this patient has severe aortic stenosis or they, they, they're they sending the patient to you because they think they have severe aortic stenosis 
or you know bioprosthetic uh, AI or whatever. So once the determination has been made, your job is to determine how to replace that valve and when to replace that valve. And you can't make the decision unless you have at a minimum a CAT scan and in some patients a CAT. So there's no reason for you not to do those tests ahead of time. And the other thing is if you want to have a successful valve clinic, you want to re- let your referring physicians do as much of the testing as possible. So you don't want them to re- be referred to you and then you cast them, you do a PCI, you do an echo, and then the referring physician never sees their patient again. So they come to me, all that has been done. And that makes for very efficient throughput and ve- makes for very efficient decision-making on my part. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, I think we're obligated to automate a lot of these processes. Even if everybody doesn't need a CT that comes to your valve clinic, you know, you, you're obligated to get that. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't know who would not need a CT who's going for a tower, right? I mean, yeah. if you're talking microclip, obviously a different story. But, um, you know, have I done cases where I skipped the CT? Yeah, if I have somebody who's really sick, who's had a CT for PE, for instance, and I can look at that and determine that they have enough valve to coronary distance for me to put a valve in valve, yeah, I'll skip the CT. But the patients who come to clinic as outpatient, pretty much everybody gets a CT unless they have really, really bad kidneys and unless there has been already significant uh, imaging done before. But the reality is, even if you have bad kidneys, you're gonna you're you're better able to avoid complications from a CAT scan than you're able to avoid complications from a valve which is too big or too small. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the CT is even more helpful for the patients that don't get a TAVR because then you can bring them in your office and show them that like nasty calcified raffe that you're not going to be able to break with a TAVR valve. You know, so I think. I think having the CT ahead of time, and the other the other thing that I told him about that I think has been a game changer for me is the CT calcium score. You know, is is looking at the calcium score and help to adjudicate patients who um, who may be moderate or versus severe. Yeah, and I think honestly, uh, and this is something that we're going to hear a lot more about in the future. Even patients for going for surgical AVR, the CT offers a tremendous amount of information. Not only for the index procedure, uh, think of all the patients that get referred to surgery and then you get a phone call from the surgeon saying, you know, they got a porcelain aorta. Yeah. It's it's always, it's always embarrassing when you get that phone call once the chest has been opened. Yeah. So there's, there's really minimal downside to a CT for uh, uh, patients going for surgery uh, you know, you could argue cost, you could argue radiation exposure, but the smart surgeons around the country are already doing it. There's a, a increasing amount of literature that supports it. And I really think that uh, from a lifetime management perspective, uh, we'll have to have it uh, mandated that that happens for everybody going for a bioprosthetic aortic valve. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I we have a lot of um, challenges in California. You know, the hospital, our clinics have to be separate, a bunch of different insurance and getting the prior OS. But um, but I think we've not given enough of effort. You know, I had a guy last week and we set him up for TAV. I looked at his CAT scan and it's a horrible bicuspid. So then I got to call him back after I've seen him and given him a date. You know, and he's actually was had seen the surgeon and an inpatient visit. And it's like now we it's. Now I got to readdress everything and say, hey, you really need to see the surgeon again because I don't think they're good for TAVR. So, yeah. No, I mean, I think Andre's approach where it's a valve, it's a true valve clinic, right? I mean, and not everyone can say that, but it's a true clinic where they're going to see an interventional cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon and a decision is going to be made for the best optimal treatment strategy for that patient. I mean, that's, that's really what it should be. And whether or not you're capable of doing that within the constraints of your system I think is is um, is important to recognize, but it's it's kind of a goal to a goal to strive for to have a true valve clinic where a patient sees an IC or CT surgeon gets a CT scan and a determination's made on their behalf. You know, 
Yeah. And I think that, you know, the valve clinic kind of started as a, to some degree, one of these PC things where, you know, it's all multidisciplinary, we all work together. But I think part of the resistance, or part of the goal initially was to kind of make sure that the cardiologists weren't putting valves willy-nilly in everybody. And I think we really have to transcend that because if you're looking at the current literature on surgical valves, you know, there's a paper from Emory from a couple of years ago showing that the surgeries that they're doing are a lot more complex. The patients are overall slightly lower STS, but they have to do more complex surgery, more aortic root enlargement. Um, and there may be a slight uptick coming up as well in uh, mechanical valves. And so the, the idea is that uh, one of the benefits of a true valve clinic is that it offers coverage for the surgeons to do the right thing. You know, because yeah. if you're if you're taking, uh, you know, any surgeon can take a patient and put in a bioprosthetic valve. But if you're doing that in a 60 year old and that person does not have an option for TAVR in SAVR in the future, then you haven't done that person a favor because you're committing them to an explant at age 70. But yeah, if, if you if you do a CT ahead of time, you know this and then you do an aortic root enlargement or aortic root replacement at age 60. Obviously, there's slightly higher risk up, up front, but it is better for the patient. And I think a true multidisciplinary valve conference is what will make that happen. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Call it, <laughs> Calling it Taver Clinic sounds bad. It's like all yeah. roads lead to Taver. Call it a valve clinic for sure. All right. It's a valve clinic. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to talking to you about lifetime management stuff, too. I know you've got a big interest in that, so we'll probably do a different recording on that. But um, but this is great. I think some really good kind of key points that we can try to try to get to get our programs more efficient. Love it. Andre, yeah, that was thanks. awesome. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Thank guys. you, guys. Thank you.